Thank you everybody for participating in this seminar. This is the second seminar of the Precision Health Seminar Series that is organized by the Education and Training Work Group of the Precision Health Initiative. My name is Veronica Berrocal and I am an Associate Professor in the Department of Biostatistics and I am one of the co-leaders of the Education and Training Work Group along with Dr. Vicky Ellingrod from the College of Pharmacy, Associate Dean of for Research in, education, in Graduate Education in the College of Pharmacy. So I am assuming that you guys are familiar with the Precision Health Initiative, but the Precision Health Initiative was launched in January and with the goal of fostering and facilitating Precision Health Research on campus. And so it sponsors um, educational activities like this one of today, but it also provides analytical tools and tools for data um, retrieval and data management with the goal of facilitating and fostering collaboration on campus among researchers that do precision health. Um, so we also will have another event next January with two um, speakers as today. And we will also have membership available for the Precision Health Initiative. We will provide more information about this in the next months. So for today, we have two speakers. The first speaker is Dr. Mark Stein, and the second speaker is Dr. Mark Keo. The plan for today is to have the first speaker give a presentation for about 20-25 minutes and then have a Q&A session, and then we will have the second speaker with a Q&A session. Okay, so the first speaker is Dr. Mark Stein, who is um, a professor in several departments across campus. Um, chemical Engineering, Applied Physics, Macromolecular, macromolecular Science and Engineering. And material Science and Engineering. Uh, material Science and Engineering, yeah. Art and Design. He has a PhD in Chemical and Engineering that he obtained in Berkeley. And he joined the Department of Material Science and Engineering in 2004. He has co-founded Arbor Light and co-authored the book, Scalable Innovation, a guide for inventors, entrepreneurs, and IP professionals. And today, he has promised that he will give a talk that is full of controversial statement <laughs> to facilitate discussion among all the attendees. So, Max. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, very nice. Um, thank you very much for uh, tuning in and showing up. Um, the, most of the names up on the, uh, up on the slide are not mine. Um, Olga Shalev was a student that uh, initially did uh, much of the work to demonstrate uh, pharmaceutical compound compatibility and applicability of this technique that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, Shao Bissos was the one that first kind of discovered this effect uh, and then uh, reproduced it, which was important, um, and Olga uh, figured out how it works and, and what it could be applied for. Shreya Raghavan and Lise Fleck were uh, students in uh, Gita Mehta's lab who helped us with some of the cell studies I'm going to show you. Uh, Greg Amadon from Pharmacology and Anna Schwendemann helped us figure out which compounds to print and, and how to characterize their dissolution and bioavailability behavior. Roy Clark helped us with structural characterization. Um, I've got uh, a group now, um, much of which is, is working on this technology technique. Um, if you want to read some more about the origins, there are two papers that are cited right here. Uh, the 2017 paper actually came out, not just accepted. Um, uh, so you can read about it online or, or talk to me because, um, to be sort of perfectly honest, uh, we've got a hammer and we're looking for a nail. Um, and so my hope is that through talking to the precision health community here, we're going to be able to find a, a good indication, a good application of this technique because we think it has a lot of potential. But, you know, even though it does have a lot of potential and you know, being a platform technology, you, you still have to kind of demonstrate the value. Um, so the, the two key papers um, are basically this. So, so when we um, started uh, doing this process, we had originally used kind of a version of this process for making organic electronic devices, uh, things that, for example, go into OLED displays that, that the new iPhones have. Um, and we saw some really strange effects, and, and those effects, I have a little micrograph, an electron micrograph up in the upper right-hand corner here um, that shows these weird-looking 
blobs, nano blobs, we called them space ball city, um, that resulted from the process. And we initially first didn't even know how they formed. It took us three years to figure out how they form. Uh, but then we did and we were able to control the process and we showed that it can have some utility when applied to the pharmaceutical space. And so paper number one was kind of figuring out how these things form. And it turns out that these interesting looking blobs are also crystalline, uh, which is unusual because in, in bulk form these crystals are faceted. Um, and it, it's unusual because you know, only pretty much biomineralization gives you smooth um, sided crystals like that. Um, and then the second paper that came out was taking this process and uh, printing or depositing lots of small molecular active pharmaceutical ingredients on lots of different surfaces and showing that you can get a combination of very high surface area and therefore very rapid dissolution behavior, um, but also crystallinity, so you know, storage stability, um, and, uh, and also the ability to, to put them on lots of different surfaces, so, so breadth of different delivery vehicles that you can realize. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit more about how this thing works, what the results are that we got, and then maybe um, share some thoughts and solicit questions actually about what uh, you think we might be able to use them for. Okay, so, so the background for this stuff is that getting new drugs to market is usually very, very expensive. Um, I don't have to tell the, the healthcare community about this. Uh, it's over $2 billion on average per drug. Um, and it involves a lot of steps. Uh, a big part of the expense is uh, obviously clinical trials, um, but considerable expense um, is, is uh, going toward drug discovery, uh, formulation, and optimization. And a lot of that has to do with certain limitations. And so, for example, 90% of active pharmaceutical ingredients on the market, and in drugs that are on the market right now, are so-called small organic molecules that weigh less than 500 grams per mole. Uh, so, uh, some time ago, Lipinski came out with this, it's called Rule of Five, it's actually four rules basically, and since then there have been obviously modifications as, as with any rule, um, that uh, for a molecule to be druggable, it has to satisfy certain criteria. So one criterion is that it should have no more than five hydrogen bond donors, um, no more than 10 hydrogen bond acceptors, molecular mass less than 500 uh, grams per mole, and an octanal water partition coefficient log P not greater than five. Okay, so, so the point sort of being is that it's gotta be a small molecule and it also has to be um, water soluble. And if it's not water soluble, that's no good. Um, and, and that presents a, a bit of a trade-off in the design of the drug because for high potency and, and greater effectiveness, it should be a molecule that uh, goes through the cell membrane really well, preferably or binds to the cell membrane well, which suggests that it should be lipophilic. But then this other criterion um, is that no, it, it should actually be um, hydrophilic. Um, so that's a design constraint that people then have to face. Um, and there's all sorts of ways and strategies for doing that kind of stuff. For example, in, in recent years, there's been a lot of interest um, in conjugates that take an antibody that uh, has good affinity for binding to specific sites on the cell. And this conjugate, ha uh, the, this antibody has uh, attached to it the payload, which is a small molecule, which has the high potency that kind of comes along for the ride. You get the binding from the lipophilic entity, and then this payload actually does, does the killing of the cancer, for example. Um, unfortunately, those kinds of drugs um, can't cross the blood-brain barrier, for example. It's kind of got to be a small molecule. So th there, there are these kind of intrinsic limitations that people have. Um, and this rule and its modifications have been used a lot in drug design, drug discovery. Um, and we are here to make kind of the bold statement that we can actually have the freedom from this criterion, from one of, the, one of these criteria, maybe two criteria. Um, so when we look at kind of how drug discovery goes, uh, you know, up until very recently, it turns out that uh, the very few molecules that were originally discovered um, were sufficiently water soluble. In fact, in, and, and for some uh, indications, this is especially true. So for cancer fighting, you know, cancer fighting molecules, most of them are very um, lipophilic, so they don't dissolve in water very well. Um, to the point where, you know, at some, at some point until very recently, about 40% of newly discovered drugs were rejected just due to poor uh, dissolution behavior. Um, 
And once you do discover a compound that works on site, and usually this is done via high throughput screening, where you take the compounds, you pre-dissolve them in DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, which is a nasty, nasty solvent that dissolves everything, including porizing the cell wall to, let, uh, to get things in. Um, you get the things in, you, you do the studies, you see what the mechanism of action is, and if you get a hit, what's called a hit, in your high throughput screen, you take that, that candidate molecule, okay, and then you try to formulate a drug with it, and you discover that it doesn't work because it just doesn't dissolve fast enough, um, or to any appreciable extent, even if you wait a million years. Um, and so at that point, you start a year or two of chemistry to modify that molecule just to engineer the dissolution property to make it druggable. Um, and that, that costs an awful lot of money. And so what we proposed, essentially, uh, after carrying out this process and achieving lots of uh, surface area uh, per unit weight, we basically proposed that we can do this with almost any drug, any small molecule. And the idea that kind of overhangs all of this is that we're going to take any small molecule, we're going to process it using this process, achieve a morphology that dramatically enhances dissolution rate. We're talking about an order of magnitude or more. Um, and then uh, using that process, because it has some similarities to a printing uh, type process, we can actually achieve combination um, therapies. Uh, this is important for lots of different diseases, like AIDS, for example, we have a combo therapy. Um, and ideally, you'd want a very easy to take dose, because what people find that even though uh, a patient's life may depend on them taking this complex regimen uh, that may involve you know, a dozen different drugs, uh, because, because of the sort of the pain of having to go through, you know, taking all these different drugs, people just don't do it. And so they die because they can't stick with the regimen. Um, Amazon recently bought a company called PillPack, whose sole sort of value proposition is taking pills from lots of different bottles and packaging them into little daily packs that a person uh, can just take more easily. And so the idea here is that we could do something along those lines, except now you're combining lots of different ingredients into a single pill or a single delivery vehicle. And ultimately, we think we're just going to eliminate the need for a pill completely. Um, so, all right, so how do we do this and, and what the deal is? Well, so the process actually involves taking that active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient, that's, that small molecule, which typically comes in the form of a purified crystalline powder, and heating it up. We heat it up, material evaporates, um, we use a uh, carrier gas like nitrogen to pick up the vapor and then we jet it out of um, the nozzle and onto uh, a surface and we can actually even jet directly into liquid in which case the solution is in instantaneous. But oftentimes you want to have things stored in solid form. So we jet it onto a surface and it turns out that for different conditions or different uh, amounts of time for which we carry out this deposition uh, you get these very interesting looking morphologies where first it starts out wavy for some of these materials then you get these blobs, and the blobs grow, and then they begin to coalesce, and eventually you get these highly dendritic kinds of shapes which have an incredibly high surface area. And if you look very closely, these dendrites have kind of, they're, they're like big trees on the surface of a you know, forest floor, and the floor is littered with these little, little nano blobs. Um, so you can kind of see that. Uh, really beautiful, they were very compelling to us, and it took us a while to figure out how exactly this happens. So the mechanism, it turns out, um, has to do with the fact that when we're depositing this, this vapor, the jet is hot and the surface is cold, relatively speaking. And so as you build up the film, uh, the organic material that you're coating on the surface is a thermal insulator and eventually you build up the heat and, and the material begins to uh, experience thermal expansion. As it experiences thermal expansion, you build up the stress, there's nowhere for the material to go, and to relax the stress, it buckles, and so that's how you get this wavy form. And then it grows because you keep depositing, and the wavy form grows into these blobs. Um, and the blobs begin to suck up material from the surface and also shield the, the, the substrate around it, immediately around it, from the incoming flux. And eventually you get more of these blobs. The blobs run into each other. You get coalescence, so-called oswald ripening, um, where you know, this, this thing on the right, you can actually see some of these blobs beginning to merge. Uh, eventually these blobs get big enough, they protrude into the hydrodynamic boundary layer that surrounds the surface, and you get diffusion-limited aggregation from the vapor phase, where molecules now condense directly from the vapor phase onto these protruding blobs, and you get these fern-looking structures, hallmark of diffusion-limited aggregation. 
So we did some analysis of this stuff and, and kind of talked about how uh, the shape of the, the crystals and the blobs changes as a function of molecular structure and, and uh, the material's properties, surface tension, Young's modulus, and so on and so forth. And that was our first paper. Um, kind of purely scientific. And at the end of it, we said, well, gosh, you know, this could be used for lots of different things. We didn't really have too many um, strong ideas about that, actually, at the time. But one of the things that we said that it could be used for is pharmaceutical um, applications because uh, the amounts uh, were approaching therapeutic amounts that we were printing uh, for some compounds, especially for high potency things. Uh, there was great control and there was great surface area. And so here's an example of us now taking other compounds that actually have pharmaceutical rev relevance, like caffeine, very important compound for me, poisonally, um, tamoxifen, which is a cancer-fighting molecule, the, the compound we affectionately call BAY11-7082, that's a trade name, um, and, and ibuprofen, for example, and, and a lot of these, except for caffeine, are, are notoriously poorly soluble compounds. They don't like to dissolve in water. Um, and so we printed them, and as you can see from these micrographs below, so um, the first row are the chemical structures of the compounds. Um, the second row, oops, um, the second row are optical micrographs, so you get these tiny crystals, and then at higher magnification, electron micrographs are, are down below. And you see that you're getting rather fine crystals with, uh, with micron or submicron uh, scale features. Um, and this is a much, much higher surface area than the powder that you start with. So it turns out that any traditional method almost that, that you use for processing these, these kinds of compounds to reduce particle size has a lot of problems. And practically speaking, it's very, very difficult and extremely expensive to get particles to be smaller than five microns. Um, all sorts of contamination issues and, and cost of processing and so on and so forth. And this, this is a known problem. Um, there are a couple of different ways of getting, getting to improve the solution, but they almost always carry a lot of trade-offs in terms of stability and storage or in terms of cost. Uh, and this process is extremely simple. Uh, we had to verify that we are indeed uh, printing the material that we think we're printing without destroying the molecule by all of the heat that we're applying. It turns out that it's not that much heat and we don't destroy the molecule. So that's these... Um, um, that's the spectra over here where you, you, you do uh, you know, analysis on, on, on the chemistry, the mass spec, uh, or HPLC. Um, and then down below, we're showing X-ray diffraction patterns for these films that are printed and comparing them to what the material starts out as uh, in powder form. So we're not really changing the crystalline structure, we're just changing the size of these particles. Okay? So, so it's the same crystal in this case. It's basically the same crystal, the particles are a lot smaller. Um, then we started looking at dissolution rate uh, and trying to do this very, very precisely and quantitatively. Um, so the experiment basically involves taking a, a disc, a glass disc onto which we deposit um, the film, um, mounting it in the appropriate kind of stir, uh, stirring it in a controlled rate in uh, an aqueous solution, and looking at the spectrum uh, optical spectrum of the solution as the material dissolves. And so as these molecules dissolve, they absorb light, for example, and you can uh, look at the optical density of the solution and tell exactly how much material has dissolved at a given point in time. Okay? So the upper left-hand corner, panel A, shows concentration uh, versus time for uh, one of the compounds. In this case, this test compound, I think, is fluorescein, um, where you know, there are a couple of things to pay attention to. So the experiment here is printing a disc that's nine millimeters wide with a thickness that varies from 40 nanometers to 200 nanometers, okay? Um, what you see initially is that the slope of concentration versus time is the same for all of these samples. So you, your initial and intrinsic dissolution rate is basically the, the same. Okay? But the ultimate concentration to which you get in solution increases for a thicker film, which means that we're basically dissolving all the stuff, um, and it's extremely well controlled. And it's proportional to the area, the, the rate at which you're dissolving is proportional to the area. So if you care about the, you know, a, a controlled release kind of property, this is one way to do that. Panel B looks at the same idea, same experiment, except what we're doing now is we're keeping the thickness the same and we're varying the, the size of the, uh, the circle that we've coded. And so here, because you're increasing the area, the slope is increasing. 
Okay, so again, very well behaved, very well controlled uh, process. Um, when we compare the dissolution rate of the, the printed film to the dissolution rate of the material as uh, powder, uh, of the pure material, you see dramatic differences. So you can do this for fluorescein, ibuprofen, tamoxifen, um, caffeine, not such a good test because it actually dissolves very quickly on its own, but we wanted to have that as, as control. Um, but what you see is that uh, the dissolution rate, you know, the slope, um, is much, much greater uh, for the printed form, for, for the film form. Um, to the tune of, of an order of magnitude, factor of 30 or more in, in some cases. Um, so for things like ibuprofen, for example, where you want that, that uh, medicine to act very quickly, right? or for things like tamoxifen, which is a notoriously poorly soluble molecule, uh, this is pretty interesting. Did you have a question? Yes. Can we think of the powder as sort of blobs of, of material as opposed to the ordered crystals of your particles? Well, um, so the powder itself is a crystalline powder. So when you do uh, diffraction on it, you see diffraction peaks. Um, so it's still crystalline. What's different is the surface area per unit mass. It's kind of like when you're, when you're trying to sweeten your tea and you take a, a big lump of sugar and you put it in versus when you pour in the granulated sugar, right? So now the granulation is happening at an even smaller scale where the particles are too small to see with the naked eye. Um, if you know stuff about processing fine powders, actually processing fine powders is a nightmare. So you can do all you want to try to kind of grind things up to get very small particle sizes, but then it's a nightmare for handling and packaging and so on. What's happening in our case, we're depositing these things onto a, a, any surface, any surface you want, and it stays on the surface. So the handling is much, e much easier. Okay. Um, so here we're carrying out um, a test uh, with help of, of Professor Meta in, in her lab, basically taking uh, these drugs, uh, coating them on a, on a glass slide, a tiny glass slide, putting them into a Petri dish that has a cancer cell culture in it. And so the blue curve here is the cancer cell culture. This is the cancer cells multiplying and uh, the curve is going up because the colony is, is increasing in, in size and population. Um, if you take the drug as powder and you sprinkle it in to the predetermined therapeutic amount, you get the red curve. That's kind of the initial killing curve that you get. You just put the compound in there. It doesn't dissolve very well. So panel A shows tamoxifen in a breast cancer cell culture. Um, panel B shows tamoxifen in ovarian cancer cell culture. You know, similar idea. Um, if you print the same amount onto glass slide like we do and you put it in, you get the green curve. You're basically doing much better in terms of killing cancer cells as opposed to just sprinkling stuff in. The control that people would typically do would, would be to take the drug, pre-dissolve it in DMSO, this nasty solvent that I'm talking about, dose it in, same amount, and then kill the cancer cells. But of course, you've got the effects of DMSO killing cancer cells, opening the cell walls, and so on and so forth. So this turns out to be pretty effective. We did this for tamoxifen, we did this for BAY11-782. Um, and we're able to coat actually lots of different things. So, so here's an example of us taking a, a compound, an API, and coating it not just on a glass slide or not just directly into some kind of solution, but then coating it onto a tegaderm patch, which is used for wound healing, printing it on, onto a Listerine tab, which is a dissolvable uh, material, dissolvable polymer, printing it onto a microneedle patch that you know, people use oftentimes instead of hypodermic needles, um, and so on and so forth. So again, these, we do x-ray diffraction on these things. Um, they're crystalline, they're stable, even though they have this interesting looking, you know, very high surface area morphology. We think it's got a lot of benefits, potential benefits for additive digital sort of style manufacturing of drugs. Uh, compatibility with lots of different surfaces. So if you want to repurpose a drug, change the delivery vehicle, it's super easy to do with this approach. Um, lots of patterns and combinations are possible. Controlled release um, could be engineered uh, much better. And it's very scalable. If you want to do this at lab scale, we're in the process of actually building an apparatus to try to do this at lab scale and process uh, more compounds more quickly, or you could scale it to something industrial. What's 
really missing is a good indication for us because we're not really from that space. We're not from that area. So we don't know what the magic molecule is or set of molecules. Um, so we're really um, interested in talking to people who are from that domain, who know various indications, who know what they would like to repurpose, um, and just kind of go attack lots of different problems and see if there are you know, nails to be hammered. So that, that's, my sort of, that's my presentation here. I'll stop. I, I would be happy to talk to you some more. Thank you. So are there any questions for Max? Ask me three questions. <laughs> so, I mean, th this isn't a technical question, but from a standpoint of um, patentability, yes. Um, is each combination, uh, is each, like if, if I took ibuprofen whose patent is long expired, and printed it this way, would that specific combination of the printing and the ibuprofen be patentable to make it financially feasible for somebody to look through? Broad, so, well, in broad strokes, yes. Um, if you change the delivery vehicle, that's a patent. If you change the formulation of it, um, you know, composition of matter type patents, you know, certainly produced by a different method, patentable. There's lots and lots and lots of intellectual property opportunity here. Um, again, because the process is new, the morphologies that you're getting are new, um, it's really wide open in that sense. So I'm uh, yes. Yeah, so you said that you can print on any material. I was wondering, does the type of material, like the substrate that you print on, does it affect the, the shape of the crystal, the surface area, like whether the, 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 pop, the material itself is hydrophilic and the, the substrate mm -hmm. is hydrophobic? So. Um, yeah, the, so the correct answer is it depends. Uh, so, yes, it can, um, and the question is, do you want it to? Um, but we're, we're doing a bit of that right now, uh, some experiments uh, in that sense, um, and the indications are that it can, but, but there are ways of circumventing that in, in case you want to achieve a particular kind of morphology, but do it on, on various surfaces, there are ways to circumvent that. Yeah. You talked about combination drug therapy, and um, let's say you want to combine multiple different uh, drugs into these crystalline structures, but is there any example of like a com like do, is this crystal structure still stable if you have like three different types of drugs that you're mm. trying to Yeah, and that depends on how you do the combination. So sometimes you could layer them, sometimes you can co-mix them, sometimes you can pattern them in like a checkerboard like like pattern. Because we're able to, you know, the, the printing resolution, if you will, the pattern resolution can be quite small the way that you can combine these things is really wide open. That's why, what I mean by digital-based sort of manufacturing. If you can program on the computer the distribution of these things that you want, we can control where they go in, basically. So yes, that's, that's pretty much open. Yeah. And do you believe that this will not depend on what drugs are you using? Or like, do you think that the process would be the same for any type of um, well, so, so we believe that this process is compatible with something like 90% of APIs that are in the market, but we're also interested in new APIs that people are developing. So, for example, if somebody came up with a molecule that works really well, provided you know, they're using DMSO, right, but they don't want to spend a year or two on chemistry, this could potentially help. Or maybe they've got things that work but not well enough, and they really need to kind of kick it over some, some threshold of dissolution rate we can do that, or a combination that people are looking at. We think that we could do that. Um, so we think it's broadly compatible with molecules that are you know, roughly less than a kilodalton, but there's other, well, so, so just the way, that, the way it is right now, um, and what we've published, let's put it this way, is that you know, less than a kilodalton, we, we think that it's gonna work. Thank you Thank very you. much. So while we do this technical change of speakers, I wanted to remind you that there is food and drinks in the back of the, of the room. So if you want to help yourself, and also if you want to learn more about Precision Hat, there is a lethal, um, I don't know how to call it, handout on the, on the table that talks about the different work groups that are associated with Precision Hat.
um, I guess I thought that I had less time, so uh, so yes, if you look at that pamphlet, there is information on the different work groups and activities that the position hand initiative um, does. And the next speaker, oh, I so the second speaker is Mark Hill, who is a, a molecular genetic pathology fellow here at the University of Michigan, and he's also the co-founder of Genomenon. What I learned is that Mark's passion is to power the practice of precision medicine by organizing the world's genomic knowledge. So thank you, Mark. Um. So this is going to be a very different type of talk. I don't have any data in the talk, although we deal with data uh, on a daily basis and at scale. Um, I am the founder and chief science officer of Genomenon, and as was mentioned, we're specializing in organizing the world's genomic information and bringing to bear some computational techniques to understand and make uh, useful some of that data in clinical circumstances and for the purposes of drug discovery. So th this talk is going to be different because I'll deal mostly with concepts. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, the way I've architected the talk, is to give a bit of a history of AI, very brief, obviously, talk about how it's being applied and misapplied in the context of genomics, and then speak to, without being uh, pitchy, what Genomenon is doing vis-a-vis -vis understanding this data um, as large as it is. So um, I'll begin with what I consider to be the hyperbolic statements made surrounding AI. This is from no meaner source than the CEO of Google, Sundar Pinchai. Uh, he says that AI, in his estimation, is more profound than electricity or fire. And uh, where I was asked to give this very talk, I gave a talk at Precision Medicine World Conference several months ago. One of the invited speakers, who's a well-respected um, uh, thought leader in the genomic space indicated without any sort of irony that AI will do more for medicine in the next 20 years than all of the other biomedical sciences combined. So that is, if, if I've never heard any hyperbolic statement that is clearly hyperbolic, I would challenge anybody in the audience to even imagine what that might mean if you take that speaker at their word. So there's reason to be optimistic about the potential of AI. Um, because of the exponentiation of these algorithms and their ability to understand and make uh, util the data that they have at their disposal, this expansion in our ability to perform high throughput computation, and especially in genomics, but increasingly throughout the, the uh, different medical, scientific, and technology disciplines, this great embarrassment of data for those algorithms to, to, to pour over. So there is reason to be optimistic, but I think these uh, two speakers at minimum have, have hit, set the bar too high. Other individuals, including the late Stephen Hawking and many, many others, have indicated, again without irony, that the development of full general artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race, and that may very well be true. But again, so could many other things, and these are um, uh, sort of keeping a cap on the, the growth potential of artificial intelligence in its current uh, practical state. So what I wanted to do uh, for, the, for the latter uh, stage of this talk is talk about what I think is actually a more likely scenario, what I call here a clear and present danger, and that is to say that many technology vendors, including and especially many in my space of genomics, are making very bold big promises about their own AI capabilities, uh, many of those promises, I would say most or, or all of them, don't hold up to scrutiny. And so why is that a danger? Why is that a problem? So pardon the, the pun here. Um, you, you may be familiar with the concept of an AI winter. Uh, I feel like winter is coming here in this respect. I'm getting chilly winds blowing when I go to trade shows and I hear vendors increasingly tab as a tagline that they're practicing AI in clinical medicine. So an AI winter follows this cycle where there are some early promising capabilities in computational intelligence. They get um, seized upon by the lay press and the claims get blown out of proportion or misapplied. Investors understand that there's potential and try to capitalize. And then as soon as rubber is meant to hit road and some of those investments need to have actually borne fruit, been successful or made money, there's an involution of that um, interest. 
and uh, all funding for, for what would otherwise be promising technology goes away. It's almost anathema to invest then in AI technologies. And so I'm, I'm a little worried about that happening. And so whenever I get a chance to, I always like to caution about what AI means and um, how it can actually be made to be useful. So I'm new to this space. I'm a, as, as was mentioned, I'm a molecular genetic pathologist by training. I first learned how to program when I was a senior in high school, so coming very late into the game. But that gives me a different perspective, I think, about what it in fact means to be a practitioner of artificial intelligence. So just um, keeping everything at a ground level, what is artificial intelligence? Well put simply, it's the creation of intelligent machines that work like humans. So you could argue that every one of our technolo technological endeavors that involve computers are in, in essence striving toward artificial intelligence. And as a scientist, when I first came upon this definition, what I like to um, draw the analogy to is if you heard an oncologist or someone in, in a pharmaceutical research lab, if they told you that they were doing science to cure cancer, that's tantamount to um, a technologist saying that they're using AI to solve some of these problems. It basically doesn't mean anything. It's extremely surface level. Deeper than that, and what, what happens mostly in big data, in, in biological sciences, and in particularly in genomics, what is being used is, is a more precise definition, but still very broad, and that's machine learning. That's simply math. I've heard pr actual practitioners of machine learning refer to this as math. It's uh, the application of statistical techniques to progressively improve computer performance without requiring explicit initial programming. And then another term that's, that's a permutation of uh, a subset of machine learning is deep learning, where there are many of these um, layers of understanding the information and many layers of processing using neural networks, which I'll show in a slide here, um, to, to make predictions about the data that they have, either in a supervised way, where human curators have told them what the answers are to a training set, or in an unsupervised way, where the algorithms actually come to those conclusions on their own. So this is what a neural network looks like. Again, I came, came to this late in the game, and so um, I'm looking at it with, with fairly naive eyes. But uh, it, this is a, a simplified schematic of a complicated phenomenon, but it can be reduced to these principles where there's an input. In an example that I'll, I'll reify here, it's the image recognition of a cat versus a dog. Google and, and many others have used that as a test case. The input in this case would be pictures of either animal. The output would be a tag for that animal. Is it a cat or a dog? So we're dealing with two knowns at the beginning. And the, to demystify the complexity in between, there's an input layer which comprises various features about those images that are abstracted. Things such as the shape of the ears. Are they triangular? Are they rounded? Are they floppy? Are they pointed? the shape of the pupils, are they slitted or are they you know, dewy-eyed circles. But then here's where it gets deep. There's, there's meta layers or metadata about those features that get less and less relate, related to what we actually see as humans. And the more layers there are, the deeper the learning goes. And there are weights that are attributed or values that are ascribed to each of those individual meta layers that then get integrated into an output layer and summated into an output call. So that's basically what deep learning is, and that is the, the mainstay in, um, in commercial applications of machine learning, especially in genomics. So I talked about cats and dogs. What I, one of the things that I wanted to highlight in this talk is uh, the, the perils of an overreach of AI techniques. And this is an example from an early experiment that highlights a caveat when applying this technique, uh, especially as it is applied in clinical circles where the accuracy and precision of the data is, is the most important. Um, so this is a, uh, an animal. It's not a cat. Uh, is it a dog or is it a wolf? So the difference between a cat and a dog is much more straightforward than the difference, say, between the, the close cousins, a dog and a wolf. And so you might look at this picture as a human and say, well, this is a wolf, it's obvious. The computer needs to create those features and meta features and weight them appropriately through, through several thousand iterations of training data. The computer may have picked out, say, the, 
the unnatural green eyes that look like they're staring at a prey or you know, the bloodied muzzle that looks like he's fresh from a kill. Um, but what in fact happened when the computers uh, actually accurately predicted that this was a wolf, the features that they focused on had nothing to do with the subject, but everything to do with its environment. And so um, the caveat here is you always need to be made aware of what your algorithms are using for those predictions, especially when you're going from supervised learning with training data to a naive circumstance where you don't know anything about this um, uh, input. Imagine the complication uh, that would be posed by taking a photograph of a, a household pet in the snow and labeling that as a, a feral wolf. So it's basically understanding at, at uh, every stage of the game, especially as it is applied in clinical medicine, what your algorithms are, are doing and understanding about the data. So it's not all gloom and doom. Uh, I'll get through some, some, of, some more of the, <laughs> the gloom and doom here. But this is actually a very promising uh, facet of the, the use of AI, in particular image recognition, in genomics. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, what this actually represents are individual molecules of DNA that are sequenced from an entire genome. They're arrayed, they're sort of stacked up on top of each other. And then the individual ATGC sequence of those DNA molecules is interrogated by a human to determine whether this is, quote, a good sequence or whether it's riddled with artifact and therefore a bad sequence. It's highly visual. It, at, in, before this study, it required a human to interrogate and look at what was otherwise very nuanced information, uh, but groups at Verily Life Science in, in conjunction with Google applied those image recognition techniques, had as the inputs all of that raw image data as JPEGs, so it had nothing to do with the sequence data, they were just pictures, and the data that they were trying to code was, was it good sequence or bad sequence? And this actually had a better than human level uh, accuracy at recognizing what is in fact reflecting an artifact versus what is a genuine true sequence result. So again, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, ge genome sequencing uh, is one of the most exciting technological advances that we've seen in, in several decades. Uh, we went from 20 years ago at this point sequencing a single human genome over 13 years for three billion dollars to with, up to the present, we can now sequence a whole human genome in a day for about $1,000. So that is supra exponential, that supersedes Moore's law, and it's, it's properly an unprecedented technological advance. So this is what the genomics community, the molecular pathology community, the medical community in general is responding to. There's a great deal of excitement and enthusiasm about the application of this new technology because there's meaningful information buried in a patient's genome. Uh, there's three billion letters of DNA in everybody's genome. Um, I, I suggested before that if you took this entire building complex and filled every room up with marbles, there's about three billion marbles. And if you change the color of just one of those marbles, that can mean the difference between health and disease for that patient. So that highlights the complexity of understanding this data and, and also highlights how very important it is to get right, where there's a great deal of data that you have to look through, so that's computationally challenging. It's extremely complex because it's genetic, and it's really important that you get the data right because it's actually gonna be used to treat uh, patients. So we can produce that data, and in fact, sequencing technology is now commoditized. Um, that's one of the reasons that the price point is so low is that we can do this at scale now. But what we can't do at scale, and what Genomenon is rising to the challenge of, is we can interpret that data faithfully. Uh, so where sequencing costs and turnaround times have decreased precipitously, the interpretation times have not changed at all, and, and even, in fact, require more people to look at that data because there's this hyper-proliferation of new information in the empirical medical literature. And I'll speak to that later. That's what Genomenon is reconciling. So the $1,000 genome is the promise. The million-dollar interpretation that goes along with it is what is sort of forcing the field to, to bring to bear more advanced techniques because uh, human labor doesn't scale with the scale that's required to, to fully realize genomic medicine's potential. So enter IBM. You're undoubtedly familiar with IBM Watson. 
Uh, Watson has a genomic health division, which was charged with unlocking this bottleneck um, and realizing the full potential of genomic medicine. I, I feel strongly that it got caught up in this hype machine, and I think that their marketing enterprise got way ahead of their actual technical ability. And I think that's, that's been borne out by several of the other um, leading lights that I've spoken with at these, these conferences. Uh, and in one of those spectacular failures that I talked about being a potential harbinger for an AI winter, MD Anderson, who as a group had invested $50 million in seeing IBM Watson's technology brought to bear for sequencing uh, patients at the genomic level and treating their cancers, they pulled out after it was found that there was no success after many years of, and, and many millions of dollars of effort. So this is one of those spectacular failures that I was talking about, but I don't want it to be said that there was no merit in what IBM Watson was able to do. It just needed to be tempered with what was actually uh, feasible in real time uh, and not filtered through the marketing department. There are many practitioners of AI who would make the claim, and I think it's an accurate claim, that IBM Watson was not actually properly practicing artificial intelligence, that they were just bringing to bear sophisticated, um, albeit sophisticated, uh, statistical techniques, but not actually using computational intelligence to um, understand the patient's data, as it was requiring many, many um, gigabytes of human curated information. So this is um, one of uh, the uh, leaders in AI, Gary Marcus, talked about the downsides of deep learning in AI, and he brought up these features of AI as it's currently practiced, where when AI properly is meant to make computers think more like humans, what we have is, is anything but at the present time. And this, this is very true of what um, uh, IBM Watson was able to do uh, at MD Anderson and elsewhere. Um, these AI algorithms are extremely greedy. Uh, the, the, the individuals who, at the New York Genome Center who worked with IBM Watson said that it, it was constantly hungry for gigabytes of data. They couldn't keep it um, sate, sated enough. It was opaque and often produced inexplicable output. We, we heard from one of those individuals at the New York Genome Center who, who likened the output of IBM Watson to that of a drunk three-year-old. So it's impressive that a computer can come up with things like that, but it was often inexplicable and, and it, obviously in clinical circumstances often rec uh, recommended inappropriate therapies for their patients. It too was brittle. It crumbled with novel inputs, requiring as it did a very thorough training from known data so that it could be then applied to very similar uh, clinical circumstances that it had already encountered in, in training data sets. And it was shallow as it does, uh, doesn't possess its own innate knowledge. And so while I was reflecting on this review, the words there are, are put in my order, it's gobs to just indicate how very greedy the algorithms are. It occurred to me and others in Genomenon how this is the exact opposite of the way a human approaches data. We don't relish looking at large data sets, notwithstanding some data scientists in the room. Um, we, even when we don't understand a circumstance, we, we produce explicable outputs. We say that we don't understand. We can start to understand what we don't understand and deal with that um, in a sort of siloed fashion. Humans in particular are very good at dealing with novel inputs and can respond to things that they've never seen before by analogy or uh, completely de novo, and obviously uh, we, we come to the table with our own uh, innate understanding of certain disciplines. And so if we're trying properly to have AI uh, faithfully reproduce the way that humans think about the world and approach uh, taking complex problems and reducing them to simple solutions, this is the wrong way to go around things. So pardon the pun. Um, uh, uh, where IBM Watson and Genomenon are playing in the same sandbox, they're infinitely better funded than we are, but we feel like we're onto a better strategy, and it's because of our approach. And this is, this is a reflection of our approach, what I've, I've called more globally how to survive a genomic AI winter. It's to think small. I alluded to the fact that I think that IBM Watson, their um, ambitions weren't scaling linearly with their ability. I feel like they had good potential, 
but they were taking on too much, trying to solve things in a black box format where there were lower hanging uh, solutions that they could have solved with all of that technology better and made more incremental and evolutionary progress. So the acronym here, it's a frequently used acronym in the context of business as well as in clinical medicine. I've repurposed it here. Um, it's to say that what you're looking for needs to be specific. We've heard some practitioners in genomics say that they're going to, quote, use AI technologies to cure cancer. And as I said before, that is a completely meaningless statement. When you're talking about what you're doing with AI, you need to be very specific in, in the promulgation of your experiments as well as when you're describing to uh, consumers what you're doing. The more specific you can be, the, the better handle you'll have on, on those experiments and what their outcomes may be. It should also be measurable. So we've heard other practitioners say that they're going to have their AI platform lead to the cures of 100 to 600,000 individuals over the next 10 years. So that is a measurable result. Sorry, it's a measured result, but it is in no way measurable. It would be impossible to attribute any of your work to that, that uh, successful an outcome. The result should be accessible, as I alluded to in the wolf analogy. You need to understand at every stage what your algorithms are doing so that it isn't a black box and you don't lose sight of what your algorithms are actually um, processing and interpreting. It should be limited. If it's not limited, as, as some of these other uh, aspects of, of genomic AI application are that I've alluded to, um, you require the need to have copious amounts of training data, almost to the point where you have the totality of information before you can then have uh, the accuracy that's required for clinical purposes. And then it should also be likely to benefit. So there are many uh, AI platforms who are coming up with conclusions that were easier to come up with uh, with a small team of clinicians. And so there was a great deal of, of um, investment and energy put forth to answer these questions that were easier to answer with a small team of, of single individuals. And so if you're, if again, we're trying to survive an AI winter, we have to make sure that we're trying to solve problems that aren't more easily solved with less effort and less capital. So for Genomenon, from, from our perspective, these are some of the small barriers that we're solving in, a, in an effort to scale clinical genomic medicine, again, to unlock that bioinformatic or interpretation bottleneck so that as, as um, sequencing costs continue to decrease, we can start bringing down those interpretation costs and making it a reality for more and more patient populations in the clinic. So there's information overload is a barrier. It's a siloed, specific barrier, and we can quantify what that means. The way we've quantified it here is in, in units of empirical publications, which is the source of truth for understanding uh, clinical genomic sequencing and diagnosing or treating patients. So information overload is a problem. Uh, as you may know, if you've um, thought about information technology at all, although it's described in scientific language, the, the content of the medical literature or the scientific literature, literature more generally is extremely unstructured. Um, it's not, it was never intended to be codified into a database, and so not only is there too much of it, but it's extremely sloppy. Um, it, when you're talking about using genome sequencing to diagnose patients, there are interpretation guidelines that are extremely convoluted and highly subjective. Uh, th it's a framework to begin. It's what the human curators and variant scientists are using to diagnose their patients, but that needs to be codified to as faithfully as possible mimic what a human clinician is doing for their patient so that the algorithm output from your AI platform uh, will be trustable by the uh, diagnosing and treating physicians. And then lastly, to fully scale genomic medicine, all of this information needs to be fully integrated so that you start to have an end-to-end -end solution of sample to report that's fully vetted with all of these uh, aspects in mind. So just to highlight one of those specific uh, aspects that I talked about, the problem here is truly extracting and interpreting genetic information right now requires a human. There's just too much of it. There's too many samples. There's too much data in each of those samples. There's too much information uh, from the empirical medical literature for any one human to have a full grasp on. This is the framework that I was talking about, and it's sort of the backbone of what Genomenon is doing. 
Right now, there are a couple of aspects of this framework that require data that is structured and that does come from databases, but none of that is sufficient to make a conclusion about an individual variant alone. Everything requires literature curation. There's 30 million titles and abstracts in the medical literature. Genomenon has fully indexed those that comprise genetic and genomic content, looking as we do for every disease, any one of thousands of different diseases, every gene, any one of tens of thousands of genes in the human genome, and literally any one of billions of possible genetic variants, no matter how an author can describe them. And we've produced that into a software solution that our clinical colleagues can use uh, they number uh, in the 2000s at this point uh, and growing exponentially. And then the last example I have here is a sp uh, in two slides is a specific use case of a patient who has this URS, sorry, UROS change from a cysteine at the 73rd position in that gene to an arginine. The question that I'd have as a molecular genetic pathologist is what do I do with this patient's data? This is one of uh, uh, many thousands in that patient's genome sequence. The databases and that information only gets me so far, and I'm required to go out to the medical literature to make that interpretation. Genomenon has found that precise piece of information, that genetic variant, by combing through those many millions of full text articles, looking for how it has bearing on disease and whether there's any treatment modality that uh, would be most amenable to treating that patient. And this is an example of that paper. Again, plucking that needle out of the haystack and presenting that information at point of care for the genetic clinician who needs to answer that question, has this ever been seen before in the medical literature, and if so, where and in what context and what do I do with it? So the parting shot is not, um, is genomics ready for AI, but rather is AI ready for genomics? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, any question for Mark? And a defender of AI. Mm -hmm. um, so just going back to that last example, um, the way the computer is scanning all the publications and then, you know, uh, pointing out uh, the research article which connects um, the gene variant, is that AI or is that like a search software? It was, I, would, I would say that we're not at AI and we don't pretend to be. And in fact, that's what we're sort of eschewing that. We're looking at the granule level information and making the, the preliminary conclusions that a human interpreter would without actually um, making uh, an assertion about the information. So in this example, what we do is look for the gene name across the millions of articles, no matter how that gene name can be described, look for that particular variant in all of the myriad ways that an author of a paper can describe that variant, and then look for across the whole spectrum of human disease, all of the diseases that might be mentioned in any paper that talks about those two entities, and then bring all that data together to the person who, who, um, who submitted that query and prioritize that information so that they can walk through that evidence on their own and make their own conclusions. So we're, I wouldn't say that we're using AI. We're getting, um, we're in the preliminary stages of organizing and assembling all of that evidence that would be necessary to then start to think about doing AI. And that's where we feel like Watson has got it wrong because they're starting out at a very high level and, and uh, sort of with a black box approach. Any other question for Mark? I don't know how, how much you follow the field. I haven't, but when it comes to using AI to sort of see patterns in pathology, H&E images, mm -hmm. uh, is that heading for a winter, do you think, or is that, has that gotten anywhere? It, it, the, the, including individuals at the University of Michigan, it has made great strides with the appropriate caveat that it will never render a clinically valid interpretation. It will always be useful as a screening tool. I'll give you a specific example. I was trained as a hematopathologist and we'd have to count bone marrow cells. Bone marrow cells come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors and it was an extremely annoying process to count through, you had to count through 500 individual cells and score them. 
Um, some of these imaging scans, pathology, digital pathology techniques, are facilitating that process by pre-organizing and pre-scoring them, and then the reviewer will approve them and then render their own interpretation. And that's similar to what's happening with whole slide imaging in, in H&E to identify places that look aberrant, that look like they might be malignant. But um, the, the conclusion is always a suggestion and needs to be vetted by a human pathologist. Uh, you know, I'm wondering, um, the hype cycle that you described, you know, this AI winter that's coming, that's just typical hype cycle behavior for any type of sure. imaging, right? So we kind of know that things are going to go through that and probably get worked out. Uh, and so I'm jumping ahead a little bit here and thinking, okay, AI eventually will be able to prescribe a particular medicine, but I can see how it'll prescribe like a 30 ingredient list of, you know, you know, comp it's, it's a thing that I have to do with a complex regimen mm -hmm. that's got lots of ingredients, and there's no way to actually formulate that. Sure. Well, except our way. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I wonder also, you know, there's this concept of canonical ensemble versus group, you know, the grand canonical ensemble. So right now you're looking at a huge data set of how the genetic code varies across a big population, uh, and then you're trying to make a prediction about what to do for this particular person. But there isn't really an ability to vary conditions or vary certain kind of things or dosages or compounds for one particular person in sure. a massive way. Yep. yep. If there were such a possibility, how do you see a utility for that or how that could be used? So th this is the sort of double-edged sword of precision medicine is the more and more granularly we parse patient populations, the less and less predictably we can imagine them behaving because they're unique in these different ways, particularly genetic or genomic. The immediate solution to that is this concept of an animal model avatar, where the patient's tumor is actually treated um, ex corpore, out of the body of the patient, where these hypotheses can be tested. Uh, in terms of a computational approach to that, I think what's going to need to happen is sequencing, as it is being fully commoditized, needs to be brought to bear in clinical trials. Right now, you parse a clinical trial population by gender and age and other, uh, other sort of clinical parameters. I think increasingly they're going to start to be parsed by genetic and genomic complexion until we start to see trends which hold up where there's one to five individual mutations or types of mutations that then uh, ad adequately stratify the subpopulations into different treatment groups. And then you'd like to test. For yes. Take a person or five. Or right. Test 15 different right. So, so genomics will, f will benefit clinical trials after it complicates them, if that makes sense. But that's, that's the model in genomic medicine, is to have an increased comprehensive understanding of each individual patient and then start to think about them not as crude clusterings of individuals who have this disease or that disease, but actually what the genetic underpinnings of each of those individual diseases is. Thank you. I think that's your thing. So I want to thank both speakers for very captivating talks, and on behalf of the work group on education and training and precision health, I look forward to see you to the, at the next event that will be in January. Thank you. Thanks,